Victoria Levier, this is Nathan Zanilek, this is Jack Annerman. Our fourth team member, Jennifer Robinson, unfortunately could not be here today, but we are Yucca Engineering. We're part of Michigan Tech's International Senior Design Program that traveled to Panama this past August to assess the water situation in a rural Panamanian community. Um, our presentation today will consist of the background on the community, the current water situation, our engineering approach to that situation, and Yucca Engineering's next steps. And Jack and Nate will take you through the background. So we flew from Chicago to Panama City, which is far over there on your right, and then we took an eight-hour charter bus ride to Western Panama to the Nobe Dube Marca, specifically the Cerro Piedra area. Uh, we got off the charter bus and hopped on the Chivo, which is basically a souped up to a pickup truck. You can cram a ton of people in the back of that thing. It's a very uncomfortable but fun ride. So we took that through uh, up into the Camarca in the mountains. It's very rough terrain. And uh, on the way out, actually, uh, we were delayed for three hours because the Chivo were going to get out and had broken an axle. The roads were so rough. The improved roads had country slabs, so during the wet season, which we were there during the wet season, they could uh, drive on this rough terrain. Um, but they couldn't go very far. After a while, we, the roads were so rough, we had to hop off the Chiba and we hiked. And we took all our gear out. <coughs> In this picture, our graduate student mentor, Zoe Miller, was kind enough to attend today. Uh, is it went into the site with us, and there's also Chris Kingsley, the Peace Corps volunteer who guided us through the week. Uh, as you can see, Chris is quite the minimalist compared to our paths. Once we reached the community of the Cobrada Arena in the Nobe Dugle, we were informed that the community was generous enough to lend us their one-room schoolhouse for the week that we were there. The schoolhouse, which was recently built and funded by the Panamanian government, is a simple concrete one-room structure. Uh, the inside, when we had things in it, you can see we had our, our hammocks on and our sleeping pads on the floor. And it was a comfortable living environment to keep us out of the elements for the week that we stayed with the community. A little bit about the Cabrada Arena community. Uh, it's made of 240 members which live in about 30 houses. Um, the interesting thing about this community in this region of Panama is 50% of the community in this area is uh, under the age of 15. And of the other 50%, the majority of those people are other citizens. And the lack of the adults in the community is due to a limited job opportunity that's located in this region of Panama. So a lot of the adults are forced to seek work in western Panama on large farms, or they may even go to Panama City or around that area. Uh, for those that choose to stay in the community for most of their life, subsistence farming is the main is the main route they take for food, and they also harvest uh, poultry and, and pigs for, for other forms of food. The topography of this region is quite extreme, as you can see from the Google Earth image here. Uh, large mountains, deep valleys, with big rivers running through them. Uh, it results in quite a bit of separation amongst the communities in this area of Panama. Many of them live in the, the same isolated region for all their lives, and they, they rarely leave that area. This is the view here from out front of the schoolhouse, and our team was fortunate enough to wake up to this beautiful sight every morning. Uh, we're overlook, overlooking the Pacific Ocean there in the distance, and uh, most of the nights we're able to watch some, some nice lightning storms in the region as well. I mentioned earlier that we were uh, in Panama during the wet season, and it was incredibly <laughs> wet. Uh, it rained practically every day, and you didn't know whether a rainstorm was going to last five minutes, four or five hours. Uh, and when it rains, you couldn't get any work done. We were out surveying one day, rainstorm hit, so this family was kind enough to let us sit in the porch, and we ended up sitting there for five hours just watching the kids play. Mm -hmm. This is a typical home that could have been found in the community. As you can see, the floor is dirt, and the roof is corrugated metal, and those are just some palm tree branches to offer some cover. You can see a clothesline with the clothes hanging up. And this is another perspective of the community. In the back corner there, those um, are just wood slabs put together, and that's a fairly renovated and more modern home in the community. And right next to the home is the kitchen where all the cooking was done, and this home here would have been similar to like a living room. And it was very typical in the community to have multiple structures for one family. This is a typical bed, and the mattress is made out of bamboo reeds. And this is pretty much what everything would have looked like. And you can also see in that picture the clothesline with clothes hanging up. Is it called automatic bed? So the normal kitchen area for these type, for this community, they use uh, three stone rock fires that was presented during a lot of other presentations. And their kitchen area is just an elevated platform where they prepare their meals, <laughs> store their pots and pans. 
Uh, if you see some dogs, there's tons of animals, all types, running everywhere. Uh, there's very little containment. Uh, we sat here at this house for about five minutes. Unfortunately, we couldn't stay longer to see what was inside that pot, but it smelled amazing. Mm -hmm. This is the area where with this house, they, uh, we ate there almost every meal. Uh, we had rice with half a sardine for flavoring for pretty much every meal. It's a more uh, improved structure. As you can see, they have a table and a concrete slab. And this family actually had a gas propane stove. However, that's not traditionally the rice. It's not traditionally what the, the uh, nobody people eat. It's actually considered a luxury. We purchased a five-pound bag for three dollars while we while we were there. But we found out that normally they eat yuck and beans as a primary staple of their diet. And yuck is like a potato starchy type food. Every time we we passed the house while we were in, in the area, the lady of the house always made us come in, and we were almost I don't want to say forced to eat, but it would have been rude not to not to eat. Huge serving portions and lots and lots of coffee. Well, like Jack just mentioned, that there was, along with all the food, there was plenty of coffee to go around for our group. Uh, while we surveyed every house, if they didn't offer food, they were sure to offer coffee. And the interesting part of the coffee that we noticed right off the bat was the way they made it, which was far from the way we make it here. Their process for making coffee was boiling a few inches of water, and with that, with a few inches of water, they would mix in the coffee. And once it reached an adequate temperature, they would then add in the rest of the water, which was on oil. And this displayed to us right off the bat that they viewed the current water quality as, as adequate for, for consumption. This picture here represents uh, the clothing that a lot of the women wore. They made their own clothing. Uh, all the houses had sewing machines. And the children were, were very close with the animals in the community as well. Some of them were domestic, others roamed freely at sea. But uh, they were all on the same team. Once we were settled in the community, we were able to get a proper assessment of the current water situation there. And after assessing the current situation, we came up with three major issues that we felt we could better in the community. The first of those issues was the flux in water supply throughout the year. Like we already mentioned, we were there in the wet season. And in that part of the year, which lasts about nine months, there's more than enough water for all community members. And there's plenty of sources to go around where they can easily access that water. On the other hand, in the dry season, there's barely enough water for everybody, and many of the sources dry up. And a result of these dried up sources in the dry season leads to a poor location for many of the houses to access the main source that's available for a few months out of the year. This picture here demonstrates a common occurrence for the women of the community and the children, where they're forced to walk several kilometers, sometimes up to a mile, with buckets of water in order to get their days worth of supply. This was a major issue that our team felt we needed to improve in order to better their quality of life. In addition to the water supply being an issue, the water quality was also a challenge that we faced. And in this picture here, you can see um, that is the source. That's where they're getting their drinking water. They were also bathing in this water and laundering their clothes. So needless to say, that was contributing to a lot of bacterial contamination that you don't want to be drinking. And here, this picture is showing the agricultural runoff and the effects it has on the drinking water source. Because this community relies so heavily on farming, that was contributing to a lot of the contamination. And also, you saw pigs and um, dogs and cats running around. That was also further contaminating the water source. Um, so after we assessed the situation and saw the challenges and what was going on, uh, we decided that we needed to see what the community actually desired. For in, to be implemented in their community. And one thing time and time again that came up was to have taps, or plumas as they call them, outside of their home or near their home. And um, another priority that they uh, said to us was that they wanted hygienic conditions. It was really important to them to have hygienic conditions and to be cleanly. And in this picture here you can see this is a mother making her son uh, wash his hands after playing with the dog before he eats a meal. And this is showing a woman washing a dog um, underneath the puma. After that, we decided to do our data collection, and we started with microbial assessments and the flow analysis. And over here, you can see um, we tested for E. coli and coliforms, and you can see the little purple circles. So it made apparent to us that there were bacterial colonies present in the water, which is obviously not a good thing or desirable. And to measure the flow, we got a bucket of a known volume, and we timed how fast the water filled the bucket up. And from that, we determined that our wet season flow was 60 gallons per minute. And the dry season flow, we obtained from our Peace Corps volunteer. And he found that to be one gallon per minute. And with that information, and knowing the community demand, 
During the dry season, we can only meet 20% of the community demand, which is obviously a problem, something that we have to take into account during our design process. And our final data collection was a survey. We surveyed uh, 300 points, and we used the ABME level, a GPS, and the tape and rod method to do this, and we measured every 100 meters for 2.78 miles of pipeline. So we had a lot of points to analyze when we got back to the states. These two pictures here show how dense and thick the vegetation was and how difficult it could be sometimes to do the surveying. But this is after community members had gone through before us and had macheted out a lot of the limbs and the branches and things in our way. And this also shows, this is a trail right here, and um, there's a barbed wire fence in the back. And that was typical. Um, because the people in the community had a lot of farmland and they wanted to keep the animals out of the farmland. So you could have a trail and it would lead right to the barbed wire fence and the trail would continue after the fence. So this was typical to encounter something like this. So once we got all the data compiled, we were able to take a look at actually what we had and where we could go from there as far as creating a system to meet the desires of the community. Uh, this is the mainland elevation profile of uh, the water system. It's all downhill, so it looks good so far. And we were able to compile elevation profiles for every single branch of every survey point. And taking the GPS data overlaid with the Google Earth image we showed you earlier, you can see water, the, the proposed pipeline for all those houses. Uh, incredibly enough, I was completely turned around while we were there, but the, uh, the community members who guided us from point to point had it all mapped out in their heads and they knew exactly what they wanted, which was really impressive. So we took all this information and we put it into a computer model in EPA net. Each yellow dot is a house where we'll put a uh, faucet or a puma. The important thing to realize here is that with the community demand, we're just under 8,000 gallons per day. Um, one aspect as well is we're going to have a spray box and a storage tank as uh, the other group earlier in the session talked quite extensively about. So in addition to the system that Jack just touched on that we're going to design, we're also going to have an in-place chlorination system. And this will sit after our main storage tank and it'll, it will provide a one, one location of treatment for all of the water before it's distributed amongst the houses. And this will ensure that treatment is, is adequate for all the homes and it'll be low maintenance. And in addition, these treatment systems are provided by, by Mensa. Additionally, this is our spring box design that we'll have. This will sit at our main source. Um, it'll provide protection for the water going in and a form of capture to get it in the pipeline and uh, transport it to the main storage tank. So after assessing the situation there and coming back to Michigan Tech, uh, we've come up with the pre preliminary design. And Yuck Engineering is planning to finish our design and submit it to the Peace Corps with a cost estimate and a user-friendly design manual. And uh, we're hoping that with the help of the recent Peace Corps volunteer in our community, that we will soon see it implemented and the quality of life in the Colorado area will soon be improved for years to come. Um, we'd like to give a special thanks to our graduate student mentor, Zoe Miller, who traveled with us, and also our Peace Corps volunteer, Chris Kingsley. And we'd also like to thank our advisors, Michael Drewer and Dr. David Watkins. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have the uh, Closing uh, session starting at, at 4 o'clock, but maybe we can take one question. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.